Okay, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Chris Young. I'm with the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team, and uh, we're here today to have our uh, all-hands uh, webinar, quarterly webinar. Um, we appreciate, uh, I know many of you are, are starting to load in to the platform here, um, so we really appreciate everybody uh, who's here and in, in attendance. Um, let's see, just a, a reminder that, you know, our vision for the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team, it's, it's not an easy one, but certainly one that uh, potentially is achievable and our, certainly is our, our vision to, to get the zero uh, fatal accidents, but we need all of your help uh, to do that. Um, and so uh, we encourage you all to, to engage and participate in the industry and, and hopefully uh, help us, help you and, and others to, to, to succeed at this vision. In our agenda today, um, we've got uh, a great cast of characters uh, that, that joins us. We really appreciate everybody that's, that's here. Uh, we've got Lee Roscott from the FAA, and he'll give us our, our kind of monthly accident briefing, which he does so often, and appreciate that. One of our ad hoc topics is going to be about fatigue awareness and management. Uh, Hannah Baumgartner from the FAA will be providing that. She was with us last on the last webinar, but we ran out of time, so uh, we'll, we'll definitely get get that one in. Uh, we've also got a, a great uh, topic uh, around managing allergy and cold symptoms with over-the-counter medications. Dr. Q from the FAA is with us for that. And then last but not least, we're going to give a quick update on one of our helicopter safety enhancements, number 82, which is, relates to helicopter flight data monitoring. And uh, Jeff Bird from EIT uh, Avionics uh, is going to fill us in on, on what's new and, and what's been progressing on that as well. Um, as you might remember, for those of you that have att attended previous webinars, we do polling questions throughout uh, the webinars, so be prepared to, to help answer those. Um, and then certainly uh, uh, opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, you can use the chat feature uh, to post those, uh, so I encourage you to, to do that. Um, also, uh, keep in mind that the, this, this participation in this uh, webinar does count towards uh, wings, uh, credits, and AMTs. I, I don't know what the exact number is for that, but uh, be sure to stay on the entire time so we can submit uh, you all to, to, uh, for that approval. Um, but again, uh, we encourage questions and, uh, and we'll try to get to everything uh, during the webinar. Um, just a quick announcement uh, for those of you that will be headed to, to Heli Expo in Atlanta. Uh, that will be taking place between March 6th uh, through the 9th, so coming up pretty soon. Um, a lot of great uh, events occurring. Uh, I put a list up uh, on the screen for you to check those out. Uh, we'll have an in-person uh, USHST All Hands meeting, so that'll be great. That'll be on Monday afternoon. And then we've got some great uh, events like the Safety Symposium. Um, that should be really, really interesting. It's hosted by uh, the NTSB. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the uh, safari helicopters accident. So that should be really, really interesting. Uh, we've got the Safety Directors Forum on Monday as well. Uh, we'll be talking about what's changed in your operations since the pandemic um, and other, uh, other areas. Uh, so we've got a great lineup there. Uh, Bruce Webb, John McGonigal, Tony Randall. Um, and so this would be really good. Um, the maintenance safety uh, topic uh, on Tuesday, uh, always important. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, you all can attend that as well. Safety Town Hall on uh, Wednesday will be really interesting. Um, got uh, folks from uh, Chevron, uh, Jessica Maris, uh, small operator talking about SMS. And th so that should be really good. Uh, the safety zone, uh, as always, uh, Chris Hill, HAI, uh, in the uh, safety committee work or safety working group put on a, a fabulous uh, uh, display there. We got the Coast Guard uh, helicopter coming in, so that'd be really cool to check out, and the crew will be there. So please stop by the, the safety zone. And of course, one of the key highlights of, of uh, Heli Expo are, are the Rotor Safety Challenge presentations, also the professional education courses, if you can get there a little early ahead of uh, Heli Expo. So check all that out on, on the Heli Expo website. Uh, see the schedule of events. Um, and uh, I hope, hope you all can be there. 
with that, I'll turn that over to uh, Nick and Wayne for uh, some, some quick introductions. Thanks, Chris. Uh, shall I go first, Wayne, and then I'll just leave. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Wayne back as the government co-chair. Um, great to have you back on the team. Um, um, thanks to Chris and his team for putting this on. It always takes a lot of organization, uh, so I appreciate that. And the only other thing I would I would love to do is to uh, just to say, uh, looking forward to seeing you at uh, Heli Expo. Um, obviously, the, the all hands that uh, Chris has just talked about. Um, it's in B303, Bravo 303 is the room. Um, if you want to write that down, take a note. Um, that's where we'll be starting off for the all hands. Um, and watch out for an announcement in the next week or so. Um, uh, I will be stepping down as the, uh, as the industry co-chair. Uh, my time is up, as they say. Um, and uh, there'll be a new face um, uh, on the block. Um, there'll be an announcement coming up shortly. So watch, watch, the, uh, watch social media and watch the, uh, the press for that. Um, and then I'll be handing over on the March the 6th to this, uh, to this person. Um, and, um, but I still continue to look forward working with the USHST and um, supporting, supporting the goals. So that's from me. Thanks very much, Wayne. Thank you. Let me do a comm check. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So first, Chris, thank you again for, for all the hard work you and your team puts into this. This is such a great meeting and looking forward to the in-person meeting coming up at Heli Expo here in the very near future. That's going to be very cool. Um, as Nick said, I'm, I'm back as the government co-chair. I'd like to thank Karen Gaddis for all the time and energy she put into this uh, as the last government co-chair. And Nick, uh, thank you for all you've done for so long. What a, what a dynamic leader you've been. And looking forward to, to the announcement of the, the person you're handing it off to. I, I would say that we had wonderful applicants and I think we were able to make, it was a, one of those hard decisions. We had so many good applicants, but I, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up today, especially our presenters, a um, couple of you I know, and I think this is just what a wonderful forum and looks like we have pretty good participation. So thank you everybody and I'm looking forward to hearing everything. Chris, back to you. Great, thanks, Wayne, and 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 welcome back. And, and Nick, thank you, of course, for so many years of of le great leadership, and we'll, we'll definitely miss you. So let's start out with our first polling question. Uh, Ashton, if you could go ahead and put that up on the screen. And for those of you who have not done this before, it sh should have a little window that pops up, and you can select um, what you think the correct answer is. Um, since 1983, what is the record for the highest number of days without a fatal accident to start a calendar year? And so folks are, are answering those questions. We continue to collect those uh, responses. We got about 72% participation. We'll wait a little bit more. All right, kind of about holding it steady at 76. Why don't we go ahead and end that poll? Looks like everyone, the majority, well, not everyone, the majority, excuse me, uh, uh, selected 53 days, um, which is pretty good. But that that's the what we have this year, uh, 2023 and counting. So the, uh, the highest was actually 80 days, and that was back in 2004. 51 days was uh, 1999. And the 48 days uh, was in 2016. So uh, we're at 53. So we're we're in a close, uh, not so close second, but we're getting there. So let's keep that rolling. And uh, again, again, that all depends on you all out there in the industry uh, keeping us safe. So um, great. Well, uh, with that, let's let's move into our first uh, topic with uh, Lee Roskop. Let me uh, stop sharing so you can share. There you go. Thanks, Chris. Give me a second here. I'll get things pulled up. All right. Can you all see that okay? Perfect. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, good to be back uh, with you again for uh, for this uh, this update on our, uh, our accidents. Uh, so getting right into it, uh, where we stand right now on the USHST's uh, five-year average fatal accident uh, rate. You can see over there on the far right-hand uh, side, we're only um, not even quite um, two months into 
uh, calendar year 2023, but for that five-year average 2019 uh, through 2023, currently at 0.74 per 100,000 flight hours, as we've talked about in the uh, in the past. Uh, since this is a five-year average, um, it's it's going to be slow to uh, to move uh, because even in the uh, the best of years, we have uh, we have baggage or uh, or goodness from the uh, from the years behind it uh, that that have to be uh, have to be overcome. So in this particular case, we have. Uh, Three years that are at around 0.8 per 100,000 flight hours, and one year at 0.67. Uh, that's factoring into uh, to the current year. But all uh, all said, uh, moving in a better direction than we had been in uh, some of the early parts of uh, of other years for our five year average. And just to draw the attention here, Chris uh, highlighted at the outset in terms of the uh, the USHSTs um, overall goal of 0.55 uh, per 100,000. Flight hours for the uh, five-year average by 2025. So just under two years uh, now uh, left remaining to reach that goal. So uh, so this chart um, is maybe one of the reasons that uh, my my presentation today will be a little shorter than it has been uh, in in other uh, months, and it's mainly because of this gap that you uh, you see right here. And uh, you know, Chris sort of teased this with the uh, with the question up front on the uh, the number of days we've started in a calendar year uh, consecutively um, without a, uh, a fatal accident. You can see our current year so far, January and then February through uh, the 22nd of the month. And in the current month, we haven't had uh, any fatal accidents. So that rate is, uh, is zero. The other bars you see up here, if you haven't tuned into these before, uh, this is our baseline rate from 2014 through 2018. And then the far right side of the chart is uh, the, uh, the end goal that we're looking at, that 0.55. The blue bar is the uh, the five year uh, average that's in progress, and then the uh, red bar is the average for only those years that are going to count into the uh, the USHST's uh, goal by the time we get to uh, the end of 2024. So again, this is another good good news chart in terms of the uh, cumulative monthly fatal accident count. Uh, you can see uh, January and then through uh, most of February so far, that that line is uh, it's still at, at zero. You know. Ultimately, if that, that makes it all the way across, I mean, you know, that, that's the vision of USHST, right? Um, so in terms of talking about rate standpoint, though, really our, our threshold for a 0.55 in a given year, if we assume that, uh, that our flight hours remain constant at about 2.7 million, which is where they've been the last couple of years, uh, we're in there around the, uh, the 16 uh, fatal accidents uh, as a total for the year. Um, with those flight hours constant would would get us around that 0.55 mark. So again, um, lower is better. So the the longer this uh, this green line can stay on the bottom of the chart, uh, that's awesome. And giving an idea just again of the uh, of the years that are currently feeding into the uh, the five year average, you can see we uh, we hit that uh, I guess you could call it a plateau from uh, 2018 through 2021 of um, around 0 0.8 per hundred thousand flight hours. Um, a bit better in uh, in 2022. Still not exactly uh, where we want to be, but uh, better than the uh, the previous years uh, for sure. And as I talked about when I think we last got together in uh, um, November timeframe, a big part of that was from around uh, July on, we were having no more than one uh, fatal accident per month, and we actually uh, had a string of five consecutive months where that was uh, where that was the case. There was either a one or a zero. Uh, fatal accidents for five months in a row. That uh, that stopped in in December with with two fatal accidents uh, that month. But um, you know, thankfully, uh, 2023 is uh, off to a strong start so far. So fatality rate, same story. Uh, very good news. Uh, 2023 so far, a, a big zero on that. You can see 2022 was slightly better than the uh, the four previous years. And if you sort of go back over the past 20 plus years, it ranked um, among our our five or six best uh, years in terms of uh, fatality uh, rates, uh, still not quite as good as uh, what we'd seen in that uh, the mid 2014 through 2017 uh, timeframe, but uh, but improvement is uh, is good. So keep that momentum going. So from an accident standpoint, uh, we're at 1.13 uh, per 100,000 flight hours for 2023. So far, uh, we've only had four total accidents that have uh, occurred so far in this uh, this calendar year. Yeah, and you can see if, uh, if that were to persist all the way through the uh, the calendar year, it would absolutely uh, blast any of these previous previous rates uh, out of the water, uh, which 
for 2022, we uh, we did see a uh, an upswing in the overall accident rate, um, fatal and and non-fatal. And this is one of those areas where I think we may have talked about it in the past that uh, fatal accidents and and overall accidents do not always uh, correlate uh, together. We've we've run different studies of that over the years, and and some years they they're they're harmonized. Other years they they move in uh, completely opposite directions. And this is one of those years where uh, the even though the overall accidents uh, were were up, the uh, the fatal accidents were actually uh, down, and the fatal rate was uh, was down. So since there's not much to report in terms of what the uh, what the industry trends have been so far for this this calendar year, just to give you a wrap up of what we look like for the 12 months of January through December of, uh, of 2022. This is how things uh, shook out for the uh, for the fatal accidents. Personal private led the way with 22 percent of the fatal accidents. This uh, the second category offshore. Uh, this this is something that um, I'll just say it's been an anomaly in the more recent 10 to 15 year uh, history. Um, for the most part, you, we can go a complete year without seeing an offshore uh, fatal accident, or we can uh, maybe see one at most two. But to see three in a single calendar year like this is uh, is really um, something that's abnormal since we've been putting things into the, uh, the industry coded categories. For the rest of the uh, of the industry sectors, you see there's a, there's not really one that stands out. A, a grouping there at uh, at two for the year, and then and then three for the year for those uh, those lower three categories. And then for the uh, the overall fatal non fatal accidents uh, by percentage for January December of uh, of last year, um, the the three that we have historically uh, seen as high remained high. Um, in terms of a proportion compared to the other industry sectors. So over 50% of our overall accidents uh, were in the personal, private, instructional training and aerial application categories. Uh, a drop off uh, from there uh, with uh, air ambulance uh, running up fourth and then another significant drop off down to the below the 6% uh, range for all the, uh, the other industry sectors. So believe it or not, that's all I have for this uh, this month. Again, um, I, I just I'll, I'll quote, quote uh, Chris Lonstein from uh, from Sikorsky. He's on our USHSD steering committee. You know, ultimately, if uh, if things are going the way that we want them to in the industry, it'll put uh, you know accident investigators and people who report um, on accidents like me out of business. So um, the more that we can continue continue that streak uh, that has started out uh, calendar year twenty three, the uh, the better. And I'll just um, kind of give a plug for you know, how we're we're only as good as what our next flight is and that sort of thing. Um, that that year that um, that Chris had the uh, the teaser question on up front, um, 2004, where we uh, we saw those 80 days on the front end of the year before we had a fatal accident. That same year we had a month where we had eight fatal accidents in a month uh, later in the year. So uh, it, it's one of those where um, yeah, I think it's just a, a testament to. Yeah, things are going great. Uh, you know, for the people that are doing things right, thanks for doing things right. You see people that are doing things right, tell them thanks for doing things right. But uh, but it's something that that has to be continued because otherwise you can see one of those where we sort of just uh, dive, dive off the uh, the side of the cliff again, and that's not what we want. Looking for you know sustained improvement uh, so that we can you know continue to see uh, you know, fatalities be a thing of the past. So that said, that's uh, that's all I have this month, Chris. Greatly, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, it's great information, I think, you know, for the audience. Uh, I think they appreciate having that data or seeing that data because, quite frankly, it's not always easy to figure out. And, and thankfully, you are bright enough to, to do that for us. So <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> and and also the, the website that you all have created uh, encourage folks to go go there on, on any given day to check out the data that's that's available to them. Um, and to your point, you know, it's, it takes everybody to, to help get this accident rate to, to zero. And so, again, for everybody that's on there, I encourage you to, to reach out to your friends, as, as, as Lee indicated. Uh, we did have one question that come, came in from uh, Richard Galler uh, asking about the uh, Army IFR training accident that, that occurred recently in Alabama. And uh, I think, you know, Lee, if you've stated this in the past, we, these statistics don't incorporate the military accidents. I'll let you discuss that further. Right, yeah, absolutely correct, Chris. Um, the the numbers that I put up there are for uh, type certificated, part 27, part 29, uh, rotorcraft and restricted category. So we don't track anything that uh, that involves the uh, the military and we also don't uh, track uh, experimental or, uh, or gyroplanes. 
Great. Not, and it's not that those aren't important and, and right. those accents uh, can lead to or help on understanding those accents can help the civilian side of the house, but for the statistics, uh, yeah, those aren't incorporated. Another question came in. Um, what category for industry do OEMs fall? Uh, example, Bell, Sikorsky, Leonardo. Uh, I, I'm assuming that, or the assumption is that they have an accident uh, at the OEM, I think is what they're asking. Yeah, and so um, it would really depend on you know how the how the aircraft is being being used. Um, you know, I know that uh, I know the manufacturers have have training schools, training operations, training academies, that sort of thing. So if it was under um, if it was being operated in that way, uh, we would put it under the uh, the training uh, industry. You know, if it was one of the uh, one of the other segments that you know more more closely mirrored a different operation, that's uh, that's where we'd put it. So uh, again, it's it's very much an it depends uh, answer. Okay. Great, thank you for that. Looks like there are no other questions. Uh, however, if there are additional questions later, please go ahead and continue to post those and we'll try and jump back uh, maybe at the very end. Well, again, thank you very much, Lee. Appreciate it as always. Yep, you're welcome, Chris. Good work. <laughs> All right, let's put up our next polling question. All righty. Um, which of the following factors do you think is the biggest contributor to fatigue while on duty in your operations? You've got workload, work schedule, family demands, physical health, other. Let people continue to answer that. What about 61% participation? Uh, Chris, is my screen up okay? Can you see it? Yes, Hannah, we can see that. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. You've got it in um, uh, you know the, all the slides listed. Just depends on what you prefer. Either way is fine. Um, say that again. Sorry. I just didn't know if you wanted to go into presenter mode. Oh, here we go. It doesn't matter. I I think everyone can see the slides. There you go. Okay. All right, well, we're at 78% participation, and uh, let's go ahead and share those results, Ashton. Um, great. It looks like work schedule uh, was selected the most, followed by uh, workload. And then we've got family demands, physical health, and other. All right. Well, thanks for those, those answers, and uh, we'll turn it over to, to Hannah and let her expand on, on, on that question and in the er categories or areas that, that contribute. Anna? Yes, thank you, Chris. And thank you guys for having me today. I'm happy to talk to you all. Um, thanks for all of your participation in that question. As you can assume, there's no right answer to that question, right? We have various fatiguing aspects of our life, our work, and we're human beings. So fatigue is always going to be an issue. Um, but it's interesting to see uh, people's, you know, perceptions of fatigue and what are the most um compelling aspects of fatigue in our day-to-day our -day operations. So thank you. Um, so I am Dr. Hannah Baumgartner. I am a human factors researcher at the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute in Oklahoma City. Um, I am also very interested in fatigue. I do research on fatigue. So this is a topic close to my heart and I'm glad to talk to you guys about it today. Um, so I promise, you know, I won't bore you too much, but I do want to start with a couple of definitions. And um, you might, you know, think that not be necessary, but I will tell you, I have done focus groups with pilots before where we've sat down and been like, we're going to talk about fatigue. And then we've had questions that are like, why are you asking me about my sleep schedule? Because fatigue really is a nebulous topic. It's something that means a lot to many different people. And because of that, it's nice to start off on a common ground um, when we're talking about this. So I'm using the ICAO definition of fatigue here, and I'm going to talk about a couple of definitions that come from ICAO documents. Um, you know, it's not even necessarily that I, I think these are the best definitions there are, but when we're talking about something that's 
you know, so encompassing all these different cognitive physiological things, it's good to have a definition. So the ICAO definition of fatigue is a physiological state of reduced mental or physical performance capability resulting from sleep loss, extended wakefulness, circadian phase, and or workload. That includes mental and physical activity, and that can impair a person's alertness and ability to perform safety-related operational duties. So there's a lot into this, and I'm going to kind of dig into some um, additional uh, definitions and topics before talking more broadly, um, because I think one of our most useful tools in combating fatigue is awareness, right, is, is knowing what we're dealing with, understanding, A, some of the physiological aspects that are going to be happening to us as human bodies, um, and also some of the cognitive aspects. So the first thing is I want to talk about what we have everybody has as a circadian body clock. And this is a neural pacemaker. And by that, I mean, it's an area of the brain, the hypothalamus, that monitors the day-night cycle. And this is really what determines our preference for sleeping at night. So, you know, people who are blind, for example, it's very common for them to have disruptive sleep patterns because they're not getting the same inputs to their brain that are helpful in regulating our light day night cycle. Um, so shift work where you're working hours that might not align with our physiological day and night is problematic because it requires a shift in the sleep-wake pattern. And that is resisted by our circadian body clock, which remains locked onto this day-night cycle. Because it's getting those inputs from the sun, going outside, even little inputs to, you know, sitting near a window and you're getting that sunlight. All of this affects our brain's perception of the day-night time even if we've gone for many hours without sleep and our body really does need to sleep at that point. So jet lag is problematic because it involves this sudden shift in the day-night cycle, which our body is not, you know, really capable of adapting that quickly. It will eventually adapt, but um, it needs enough time in that new zone. We have natural periods in our day-to-day -day time of ups and lows in our circadian cycles. And by this, I mean, we have different physiological inputs to our body telling us to remain awake or telling us to go to sleep. And those are what is guided by that neural pacemaker regulating it through uh, light cycle times. And because of that, we have natural periods of time where we're at our lowest, where we're most pushing our body to sleep. And we also have times where we are most alert. So you might have heard of something called the window of circadian low. And this is a time, it's commonly referred to around uh, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., where our circadian body clock cycle um, is really pushing for fatigue and sleepiness, where you're, you know, say, most likely to want to sleep. Um, this wackle, as it's called, um, occurs around that 2 to 6 a.m. period, um, and it's also a daily low in our body temperature. Our body is adapting to this daily cycle, telling us now is the time to promote sleep. Um, there are some individual variations in the exact time frame, so that's why, you know, we capture this window, but in general, that's when you're going to see it. On the other hand, we have periods throughout our day, like this one called the evening wake maintenance zone. And this is something you might be very familiar with, you know, right at the end of your night, um, you've been tired maybe from working all day, and suddenly you hit about that 7, 8 p.m. mark, and suddenly you have all of the energy in the world, right? Suddenly sleep seems so far from you. Um, and so this is a period of several hours, uh, you know, right at the end of our physiological day where our body is really promoting awake and alertness. Um, so often you'll see this around uh, 7 to 10 p.m. at night, um, right before our body's going to sleep. It has, you know, worked this long day already and telling us, hey, you need to put some last energy in to make it to the end of the day here. Um, and it's really hard to go to sleep at this point in time, which is also why, why it's so difficult as an individual to try to go to bed early, right? If your body is on the schedule already, it wants to maintain on that schedule. So these are just some of the things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis that our body is urging either alertness or sleepiness. 
And ultimately, we have this constant sleep homeostatic process going on. And this is, you know, as I KO document here defines it, the body's need for slow waste sleep, which is non-REM stages three and four, this deep sleep. And this need builds up across waking hours and discharges exponentially across sleep. So this is basically, we have this level of, um, it, in the brain, you actually accumulate adenosine, which is this neurochemical. And uh, the reason that caffeine is so effective is that it is an antagonist for these receptors, adenosine receptors. So it's blocking the receptors that adenosine would bind to, and therefore it's kind of stopping um, some of the slowing down physiological effects that adenosine normally has throughout the day. So throughout the day, we have adenosine building, building, building. You get a cup of coffee and then suddenly it's not going to be working as hard. It's not going to be um, able to, to exert that sleepiness feeling on you. But the problem is that the adenosine is still there, right? It doesn't get away with the sleepiness that'll come around after the caffeine goes away. Um, but it is one of those interesting things about what's uh, how we're able to kind of modulate our body cycles a little bit here. Now, when we're talking about the factors that can help alleviate this sleep process as we're, you know, working throughout our day and gaining this level of sleepiness higher and higher, um, there's a couple different definitions here. And these are the last few I'll throw at you, but I think it's helpful just, you know, remembering that we're looking at sleep and fatigue from many different facets. And all of these are important factors in really understanding holistically the idea of fatigue. So for one, we have a cumulative sleep debt. So this sleep loss is what's accumulated when sleep is inefficient for multiple nights. Um, so this builds up over time. Say you have a you know, week of work um, and you are waking up early each day for work and then suddenly you hit the weekend, right? Now you don't have to wake up so early and you really sleep in. That's where you're fighting off this cumulative sleep debt across multiple days. On the other hand, there's also acute sleep loss, which has a little bit different of an impairment um, profile. Um, here is where, you know, you stay up for longer than 16 hours in a row, and you're really going to start seeing some of those cognitive impairments, performance impairments with work, um, and just the the basically fighting off your circadian drive for sleep at this moment. So those are two different facets of, of sleep debt, sleep loss. We also see sleep quality, of course, is a big factor in what's going to promote recovery or going to promote more fatiguing um, cognitive effects. And that really has to do with um, your ability to get the different stages of sleep. So non-REM and REM cycle. And REM stands for rapid eye movement. Um, it's a stage of sleep where you'll see some uh, body movements some rapid eye movements, which is why it's called that. Um, but really it's the, the different stages of sleep together um, and uninterrupted, the going back and forth between non-REM, REM, different stages of it that are what's important in promoting high quality sleep. Um, and that's what's gonna lead to recovery sleep. Um, so if you have acute sleep loss or cumulative sleep debt, um, your sleep is really a recovery type sleep. And it's not gonna be one-to-one -one where you stay up six extra hours and then you know six hours of sleep will make up for that. It's really a lot more complicated than that. And our body processes can take multiple days to recover from different types of sleep, uh, sleep debt or sleep loss. And so um, it's really something that, that matters for an individual type basis. Now, um, thank you for you know uh, letting me go through these definitions. I just wanna say as a researcher, you know, some of these things might seem obvious to you, but it really, really matters when we're talking about things. And you know, I like to use this as an example of how would you define backside of the clock operations, right? Because this is something that intuitively, we all know um, backside of the clock operations would be very fatiguing as a schedule, right? But when you sit down to talk to someone about it and you say, okay, we're talking about operations that are say from midnight to 6 a.m. And then somebody else says, oh, well, I mean, that's not so bad for me. What I care about is like the 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. period. 
and it gets really difficult sometimes. So that's why I like kind of having this um, first and foremost, these are the things we're talking about here. Um, now, whenever we look at helicopter operations specifically, um, there are a few things that pop into my mind as a sleep scientist of things that are uh, particularly maybe um, risk factors for high fatiguing operations. So high task demand, you're focusing a lot of attention um, on your physical body movements whenever you are uh, operating the helicopter, right? Um, you have to have your uh, your arms in place, you have to have your attention alert, um, things are moving very quickly, you're flying low to the ground, there are obstacles around, your mental attention is really spread sparse across many different things going on. Even the loud noise and the vibrations here, right? These are other things that take a toll on your cognitive ability to really um, spread your resources thin here. And these are things that very quickly can pile up and lead to uh, excessive fatigue. Um, different factors like night vision goggles. Um, and then there's also psychomotor fatigue. And so by that, I mean, it's not just the cognitive processes, but your muscles, the controlling of your muscles. These are things that uh, really take a toll over um, these operations and, and things that come to my mind when I think of what might be particularly fatiguing in helicopter operations. Um, in general, you know, whenever we look at any type of shift work, which can be common in some helicopter operations, there are things that raise the flag for fatigue issues here. So um, risk for circadian disruptions. I also, you know, I talked about um, the wackle, the window of circadian low, um, before that period from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. when our body is most prime for sleep. Um, and, you know, if you're working shift work that you have to be on call during that period, that is going to take a huge physiological toll on your body, especially long term, right? Um, these are things that lead to increased fatigue over the course of that one shift or many shifts. Um, it is important to note that individual differences can vary greatly, but, you know, there are people naturally, you can think of um, people who are early birds or late owls, and we really do see that in um, the literature, the scientific literature and physiology as well, um, we call them chronotypes, right? Where there are some people who are early risers and they perform better at that morning, but they go to bed and they need their sleep starting at an earlier period and people vice versa. So while there is a range of some individual variation, it's only going to be so much. So, you know, no matter how late owl, of, uh, owl you are, um, naturally, physiologically, that window of circadian low is never going to be too much of an ideal working time period for anyone. Um, shift work and work where you're on call also has the issue of high and low workload um, trade-offs. So fatiguing operations can happen whenever there's high workload, but also during low workload, right? Um, I think we can all kind of understand that idea of um, maybe being a little bored where you don't have a lot of work to do. And that can also be extremely fatiguing because your mind kind of shuts off at that point, right? And it's hard to turn back on. And so having that variation in your workload um, at that point can, can be very fatiguing. Um, inconsistency in schedules is also a huge um, issue that can lead to fatiguing operations. And this is true both for your work schedule and your home life, right? We all know that there are things at home that can um, interfere with our ability to get right sleep, especially maybe it's an off day. I'm trying to really, you know, do my best to catch up on this sleep debt. Um, but of course, there are things at home that, that don't always make that the most opportune place and time to sleep, especially if you're working um, shift work where the hours are flipped, right? If you're trying to sleep during that physiological day period. Um, I did want to note that there is some research showing that what's key in these types of operations is really schedule consistency. So there is some research done um, looking at air ambulance operations, um, especially in Norway, and they seem to have um, pretty good 
management of fatigue through their strict scheduling operations as much as you can manage fatigue and in shift work. It's always going to be an issue, right? It's just about managing it and making it um, as small of an issue as it can be. Um, these can be, of course, hard to compare to the U.S. operations. Um, there's lots of differences at play, but I did want to highlight that there is some scientific literature looking at these individuals um, and, and suggesting that keeping consistent schedules is, is perhaps a very strong, um, it, it's a good tool to have. Now, of course, when you're dealing with fatigue, um, questions about napping come up and the benefits of napping. And napping is always going to be a powerful tool to combat fatigue. Um, but that said, there are different pros and cons of it, right? So while napping is great, um, the most restorative sleep will, of course, be the longer term sleep where you have um, the different stages of your sleep cycle, where you're able to go between non-REM and REM um, and really recover that way. Uh, most napping is not on the same time frame that that is possible. And so, of course, it's not going to be as good as longer sleep opportunities. That said, napping can be an excellent tool, and I always recommend it if it's available to you. Um, it's important to know, though, that, of course, you know, factors such as time of day, right, it's a lot harder to nap at noon, right, when the sun's out and you're having those biological signals um, than it is to nap in the middle of the night. Um, environment, length, all of these are, of course, factors, and, and we all know this through our own experience. But another thing about napping that is, you know, something to, to keep in mind is the, uh, the occurrence of sleep inertia after a nap. Um, and sleep inertia refers to this kind of impairment upon waking. So it's this cognitive impairment that we all experience, you know, sometimes better or worse than others after waking. Um, sometimes it's affected by, you know, what stage of sleep you were in whenever you are woken up. Um, but in general, it's a period of recovery that you know you want to say at least 20 minutes to have recovery um, to fight off this sleep inertia and really turn your body on, right? Um, so in on-call work, you know, both um, pilot work, also, you know, think about doctors, um, you want to try to give that 20-minute window at least of um, preparation among upon waking from nap in order to really like turn on your body and get going. Um, and that's something that's hard to do and hard to, to speed up. But I did want to highlight that there is some research looking at different, um, you know, options here to try to help fight that sleep inertia. You know, there are some things like you can drink a cup of coffee and then go take a nap. And so by the time the coffee's kind of kicking in, um, you're waking up and that could help fight you know, sleep inertia. There's also things like polychromatic shortwave and rich light, which is a fancy way to say um, there are special goggles that researchers are looking at now that shine specific wavelengths of light that will help promote wakefulness. And so there's some research, at least in the lab setting right now, that these are helpful for switching on um, and preventing that sleep inertia right after waking up. And what's important here is that they're not detrimental to switching back off. And I say this because especially in on-call type operations, that's one of the considerations, right? You're taking a nap, you're woken up, wait, it was a false alarm. I don't want to have done anything that will prevent me from getting any more sleep in this period where I really should be trying to get the most amount of sleep possible. So it's really hard to have um, things in our toolbox that are helpful in, in switching us on, but on also switching us back off. And so these are some of the different um, aspects of fatigue and sh shift work that I think are really important to think about um, in helicopter operations. But I will say a lot of my research has worked with pilots in um, airline studies. And so I just wanted to highlight a little bit about this because there are some uh, interesting facts here um, that I think will be also beneficial for helicopter operations and also will inform some future research, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I mainly just wanted to say that I, I recently performed this focus group study with NASA where we looked at short haul flight 
operations. So these are pilots that are doing those short um, flights, you know, two to four hours um, where they're doing multiple shifts in a day, multiple flights in a day. Um, and what they reported to us as the most fatiguing operations um, are things that make sense from, you know, a circadian perspective, but also things that would we will probably see um, looking at helicopter pilots as well, that the most fatiguing operations are flights that encroach or go through the window of circadian low at two to 6 a.m. or flights that involve circadian switches. And by that, I mean um, that schedules that say you're scheduled for an early morning schedule, um, then you have a day off and then now you're on night, right? So your body's being forced to shift drastically for these schedules um, and especially kind of the opposite way around, right? Of working nights, working nights, working nights, day off, then oh, now I'm early mornings, right? And so forcing our body to adapt even more to these schedules um, that are maybe not um, ideal for our physiological day is a little difficult. Okay, and I'm realizing my time now, I'm almost done. Um, I just wanted to say, yes, so right now, based off of that focus group study, we're now doing an investigation with short haul pilots. Um, and the ways that you can assess fatigue, um, we have objective measures and subjective me measures. So objective measures include things like the psychomotor visualist task. Um, this really easily now. It, we can do it on iPhones or on an app um, where you get a measurement of someone's um, response time, but also it's a, it's a proxy for kind of alertness and vigilance. And it's a really good measure of understanding um, how fatigued a person might be. Um, we do things like monitoring sleep through sleep diaries and activity Graphy data, which is very similar if you wear something like um, a Fitbit or something like that. Um, it can give you some similar ideas about heart rate um, data and things like that that help inform um, your circadian rhythm and, and give us as researchers an idea into your circadian clock cycle. Um, then, of course, there are subjective measures, right? So pilots filling out surveys where they can look at um, fatigue, uh, their self-reporting fatigue, self-reporting sleepiness. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that there are some people now that are looking at this specifically for helicopter operations as well. So this was one recent study that looked at helicopter crew transport fatigue assessment. Um, this was looking at air ambulance operators. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that this is the end. Like this is, you know, the, the specific... Uh, assessment that everybody should use, not necessarily saying that, but more so um, that there are movements now to try to have operationally specific assessments. And so you'll notice on this um, right here, you look at some of the different questions. Um, did you use NVGs? Um, and then there's also aspects of kind of other physiological um, mechanisms that can affect your fatigue. So how many hours since you last ate? How many hours since you last drank a non-caffeinated or alcoholic beverage? So the idea that researchers here were trying to look at was um, come up with something that somebody can check off and, and give themselves an idea of how fatigued they might be at that very moment. So again, I'm not saying that this is, you know, the end product everyone should use. I wasn't associated with a study, but I'm just saying that these are the types of things as researchers that we look for um, um, to help try to provide this to pilots. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to also say right now um, that though my work mostly has been in a uh, transport category aircraft pilot so far, um, what I will be doing in the near future is starting to look at fatigue and helicopter ambulance operators. Um, and so there will likely be a focus group study followed by a field study. Um, and I will you know, probably be reaching out to different operators in the near future as we start to plan some of the specifics about this. So um, if you have any uh, questions for me, um, please don't feel free to reach out. Here's my email address, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, Hannah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Really relevant information uh, for everybody. I know there's a couple air ambulance folks on, on the Webinars. So I'm sure they're appreciative of, of the study and the information uh, regarding their type of work. But yeah, fatigue is definitely a, a 
kind of a shared responsibility, right? Between the workplace yeah. and the home. And so as, as individuals, it's incumbent upon ourselves to, to make sure that we show up to work fit for duty, ready, not fatigued. And if we are, we need to account for that somehow. And some of those uh, recommendations that, that you right and it's and part of that is also creating the culture right that it you feel comfortable recognizing your own fatigue and and reporting that and making the smart decision to maybe not take that flight or yeah great we did have one question uh mm -hmm. from richard Geller. how much does age affect fatigue mm, yes definitely age definitely affects fatigue um and you know at different ages, we are more likely to need different things out of our sleep, kind of, if that makes sense. So, you know, the idea of, say, teenagers being uh, night owls, staying up late, having trouble in the morning, physiologically, we see that as well. Um, typically, as you get older in age, you do require um, more sleep for recovery. Um, you know, you think about all the changes our body's going through, and there's a lot more energy that needs to be taken to, to help maintain um, our normal selves. And so um, age is definitely a factor and you kind of have to learn to adjust your own needs as, as you do age. Right, because uh, we can't get younger yeah. <laughs> as much as we all wish we could. Uh, great, well, thank you again, Dr. Baumgartner. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, thank you for having me. Folks have additional questions, uh, please uh, uh, send them out. Um, yeah, some question about the links for uh, a date. Well, actually, that was for some accent data. Anyways, we're good. Sorry. Question for somebody else. <laughs> All right, let's do our next polling question. Uh, Ashton, please. Okay. Uh, if a pilot takes a no-go medication, how many hours should they wait to fly if the package direction is to use the medication every 12 hours? Is it 24, 48, or 60 hours? All right, why don't we go ahead and share those results? Uh, we got 47% said 24 hours, 41% said 48 hours, and 12% said 60 hours. Um, if Dr. Q, I know you're limited on time, would you still be able to kind of briefly, well, first help answer the question and briefly go through some of the information? I don't know if you're still on. Hey, hi. Hi, sorry. No problem. I apologize. Um, I have to cut the meeting a little short because I didn't realize the time is uh, past a little another obligation. But I would like to spend a little bit of time to see if I can um, answer some of the questions. Thank you. Um, for the for the polling question, it really depends on either the half life. Of a medication, if you don't have the half life, then it would be um, the the interval of the medication. So um, five times the interval of the medication. And so if it's five times um, a medication that's taken every twelve hours, it would be five times twelve. So the answer would be sixty hours. And I know the wait time is usually one of the hardest questions to um, to kind of answer. So I wanted to kind of go over. Um, two resources that we have available. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Q, maybe maybe what, what are some of those no-go medications? Yep, let me show you um, the resource. And then on that page, it has the website on it. Let me, which screen do you see? Do you see my page? I, I see the presenter mode screen presenter one so that's the wrong page and if not don't worry about it we, we, if you i think everyone can see it pretty well if you just want to go to the next slide uh, now no. okay. so this is a document that we had created um 2019 in conjunction with 
G-H-A-S-C. Um, you can find it on um, FAA's website, um, faa.gov backslash go backslash pilot med is a five page article um, that kind of goes over um, several of the main over-the-counter medications. And I was focusing most of today on the symptoms of allergies and cold. And on page four, I believe three and four, it goes through um, kind of the go medications where if you take it, um, if it's the first time you take it, there's the usual default 48 hours, so you know how the medication is. Um, whereas the medications that are no-go, they generally have more uh, side effects that are concerning for aerospace. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to key in that's not on the page is medications have two different names that are mostly seen on the medication products, and that is either the generic name or the trade name. And it's either a trade name or brand name. So the problem with the generic name is it's usually more complicated to say. And so most people tend to say medication by the brand name, like Tylenol versus acetaminophen, um, Aleve versus ibuprofen. But the problem with knowing a medication by the brand name is brand names have um, more than, it can be either a single medication or multiple medications. And if you only identify a medication by the brand name, the biggest name that's usually on the box, you probably won't be able to identify all the medications in there. Um, and when it comes to cough, cold, and allergy medications, a lot of them are combination products. So for all these boxes down here, they all look pretty different. Um, Tylenol cold, Alka-Seltzer, Dayquil, Sudafed. And most people who know Tylenol, they just stop at the word Tylenol and think it's just acetaminophen. But the problem is it comes in multiple colored boxes and this one's actually Tylenol cold multi-symptom. Or Sudafed can usually be just a nasal decongestant, but when they say Sudafed PE, pressure, pain and congestion and cough, it's actually a combination of these three medications. So although these five boxes below look fairly different, all of these products, um, whether it's a multi-symptom or plus, they all have acetaminophen, dextromethorphan, or phenylephrine. And the other example I have is, it could be a liquid, a tablet, or even a pill. Um, and all these, although it still says a really big Tylenol or Sudafed or just Mucinex, which most people identify as a um, cough uh, um, expectorant, all four of these have four medications. And um, when they're branded, it either says max, severe. So there's no commonality to know that if it says severe, it's gonna be certain medications. So the best thing to do is when you flip to the, I'm jumping all over the place, apologies, because I have to leave in at least one more minute. But if you look on the back of the medication, any medications, whether it's above the peel or below the peel, if there's not enough room, you'll see a medication label. And all goes in particular order where the top section is going to be the active ingredient. And that will tell you how many different medications are in there. Um, so you want to identify the medication. And right in the middle is going to be the warning label. And if the product says that it's going to cause drowsiness or be careful when driving a motor vehicle or operating machinery, more than likely it's going to be concerning to aerospace medicine, um, to, you know, to flight. And it's more than likely going to be on the no um, no-go list. And that below the warning is the directions. And for this medication or another, it may be used either every four to six hours, which is common for a lot of cough and cold medications, or it can be every um, 24 hours or daily or every 24, uh, 12 hours. And depending on that time interval, if it's every 12 hours, you're going to multiply that by five and that's gonna be your no-fly time because once the medication's in your system, it's gonna take five times longer than that to get out of your system to decrease the risk of any fatigue or anything that's concerning in flight. Um, so for the answer to the poll, because they're gonna take it every 12 hours, it would be 60 hours. And then if it's a four to six hour medication, we're gonna take the higher of the two and it's gonna be six hours, multiply that by five and it's no-fly. 
So when you go to the website, you'll have um, a pretty good table that kind of identifies what's a good medication without a lot of wait time after that no-go, and then a rationale as to why it's not. Um, that's great, that's, Dr. Q. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I did post uh, in the uh, chat for everybody I, the link to that document, Dr. Q, that you uh, uh, are showing. So for everybody on the webinar, please go to that link. Um, it's actually great information. Um, I really like how it, the document starts out, you know, and you know, we all have heard about a pre-flight risk assessment to understand, you know, how what hazards might we might encounter before a flight, you know, I am safe checklist. It starts out, I, am I sick? And it kind of goes through some different uh, check boxes for you, for you to, to help better evaluate um, yourself. So uh, that's a great document. And that five times uh, requirement that dosage interval, I, I wasn't aware of that. And so that's very helpful. And I'm sure there are others that are not and realize, wow, if it's in every 12 hour, type of medication, you have to wait 60 hours. I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people that weren't familiar with that. So thank you for providing that, very helpful. I, I don't see any questions that, that have come in, um, but if there are, please let me know. I can share those with Dr. Q even after she signs off. Thank you to everyone for letting me present. If you have any questions, please send them to Chris and I'll answer them. Thanks, have a Dr. wonderful day. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay, Ashton, can we put up uh, our last question? Do you use helicopter flight data monitoring in your flight flying activities? Yes or no? Let those continue to come in about 60%. All right, let's go ahead and uh, share those results. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so we've got 65% of y'all participating said no, and um, 35 said yes. All right. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff Bird, with EIT Avionics. Um, he has been very involved with uh, the helicopter safety enhancement re related to helicopter flight data monitoring. Um, this a type of equipment tends to be relatively a newer technology for helicopters. Um, however, there are a lot of great uh, resources now uh, that are either uh, less expensive uh, and lighter in weight. So um, it's a great tool for helping manage uh, risk exposure. So part of your SMS um, and being able to incorporate uh, into training as well uh, on, on performance. So with that, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and yeah, so to, um, let me see the right screen to share here. Might being yes, I think you are seeing the right screen. Um, so to your point, the um, the technology has been improving over time. It's become uh, less expensive. Um, I, I've been uh, honored to kind of uh, be part of leading the charge here on uh, trying to get some outreach uh, regarding HFDM to the public and. The Irony being that um, the folks that usually most need to hear this uh, message are often not the sort of folks that uh, wind up uh, on a safety call. So in a way, I was actually excited to see that perhaps um, 60 odd percent of the folks on this call may not be using HFDM currently. And um, maybe I can help connect the dots as to um, that might be easier than you suspect and it might be more beneficial than you suspect. Um, I'm going to focus on the actual safety enhancement uh, for this uh, briefing, 
and uh, you'll you'll see where I'm going with this as far as the uh, the prom support material here in a, in a few minutes. So a quick review of what is HSE 82. Uh, it is specific to helicopter flight data monitoring. Um, this particular safety enhancement is sort of uh, my favorite, not necessarily because I'm on it, but because it informs all the rest of our safety enhancements. So whether you're talking about an accident rate, whether you're talking about what your flight department performance on 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. regarding sleep schedule, just like we were uh, talking, or um, or if somebody suddenly got a change in the way their flying approaches, and you can relate that back to a change of medication that they thought was fine, um, but a performance uh, consequence. Um, and that's just today's topic. So you could easily imagine how having a data recorder on your aircraft might change how your flight department operates. Um, and, and just as a, a, a bit of humor, I, I've often joked, if you if you bolted a piece, uh, a bar of soap in the helicopter and told pilots that's a data, it's going to capture everything you do, you've already changed behavior. So um, it's fascinating uh, psychological. Um, however, specific to the uh, HSE, um, I'm going to do an overview of scope, which has changed a little bit since we uh, started this effort. And we do have some changes, which I'll go over. Uh, output number one is the outreach uh, of today's meeting is uh, a little bit a part of. Um, we're 99% complete, and, and I'll say we've been 90% complete for something like two years. We're waiting on uh, a little bit of input on some uh, video content and a, a real simple to understand HFDM guidance document for those who might be uh, unaware or uninitiated uh, HFDM. Output number two is now out of scope. I'll detail it slightly at the end of the presentation, and I'll go over uh, final goals and objectives uh, in the last slide. So the, the real um, mandate for HFDM for the safety enhancement was to review what HFDM materials were already out there and develop any new materials that might be missing or address a gap. Um, so that took actually a fair amount of time. There's an awful lot of material out there. Uh, it's very comprehensive. And the final output of this report will link to those things. However, it's not well suited for somebody not subject to the mandate. So in other words, if you're talking about a, a small operator who is not subject to a uh, HFDM or SMS mandate, um, those folks um, could easily take advantage of having a data capture system and a monitoring system uh, for their operation, and they might not understand it's easier to do than you might suspect. Uh, in fact, I've talked with a few operators who do a paper only um, SMS type HFDM, and, and those folks aren't using technology at all. Um, the, the, the focus of this enhancement is, of course, the technology aspect of it and how it might benefit. Um, so to do those things, we have done outreach at a number of industry events. We've done a, a number of safety seminars and online events. And again, I'll just point out the, the, the slight irony. Um, the folks that we usually are preaching to are, are not the folks we're actually trying to reach in most cases. It's the folks who are out there flying small operations and aren't actually at the safety seminar. Those are the ones we're trying to um, um, get some information to. Um, last two points were a little bit peripheral to the effort, but um, we, we were trying to promote data collection for ASIAS, which uh, if you're not familiar, it's a metadata effort such that if we all contributed our data captured from flight operations to a central place where we might um, strip it of identifying information, but do analyses, you might be able to capture trends, say, specific to the make model helicopters you fly, or maybe you could uh, filter for trends um, specific to the region in which you fly um, or the type of flying you do. So there's some real powerful tools that we can uh, employ to uh, really make some safety improvements if we are able to do the data capture. And the last one is, uh, you know, NTSB is very much had uh, an expanded uh, use of crashworthy data recorders as one of their primary wishes for quite some time. 
So the changes to scope uh, output number one, which again is the outreach, um, we're going to declare output one complete upon release of the summary document. And as I mentioned, documents will link to um, the online resources and we have two yet to create. Um, so we're trying to emphasize the HFDM benefits to folks not subject to the mandate, which I already mentioned. Uh, we need to make it simple. Um, we need testimonies from folks who already operate HFDM to say, hey, you know, it cost me this much to uh, implement. And just last year, um, this is how much it saved with regard to my operations and so forth. So those kind of examples are really um, powerful to get folks to uh, to think about uh, using HFDM on, say, a small operation. So any of you folks on the on the call here that are using HFDM, and if you've got just even a one or two minute example of what that looks like, please get a hold of me. I'll put my contact information up here um, because I'd like to um, have just a few real world examples there that are easy to understand for folks to uh, to latch on to. And uh, the second point is, as I was simplifying and focusing our messaging with page document um, to, to show how folks can set up a simple HFDM system. And in this case, I'm, I'm targeting folks not subject to a mandate, not the NFA approved HFDM. It would not be part of a FOCA system that's required. This would be folks operating a small flight school, or maybe they've got another um, helicopter fleet situation um, that could benefit specific to their own operation, uh, having that data capture system. So output number one in specific, um, this past fall uh, had a circulated summary document in, in draft, and I got some comments back on that. And I thank everybody for um, uh, sending your comments to me that participated. Some some of you folks are on this call. Um, all the comments were very good. Um, the the materials we were looking at were all very much um, comprehensive, but but you know one or two hour presentations aimed at folks that are subject to a mandate. I don't think we're going to wind up being too effective with. So as a um, uh, a last task here, I'm, I'm putting up my hand. I will make sure there's at least one HFDM testimonial video and um, at least one one to two page reference that um, can be distributed that kind of gets the, the hooks into the idea of HFDM can be for everyone. It's simple enough. The technology there, um, the benefits are, are um, large and really push that accident rate we've been talking about in a more favorable direction. Um, in detail here, output number two, this will be pursued by other means. I will document these details in the summary document for HSC 82. Um, the bottom line here is this was originally going to be um, an FAA um, interface uh, project in which we would be looking at um, changing or advising some policy. Um, we're going to do that, but we're going to be outside HSC 82. And the same thing over and over, and I've made it in pretty red letter, letters there. Um, looking to complete that video content for HFDM testimonials. And again, that could be some of you folks on this call. Um, I will do one myself as well. So we'll at least have some materials here that are going to be linked to the final summary document, as well as a one or two page safety sheet, um, which uh, basically is going to be HFDM for everyone. It's got to make the case to employ technologies out there, and here's how you can do it. Uh, once the safety enhancement is closed out, uh, we will be con continuing to create further HFDM materials, both on the safety team, and I can speak uh, personally for, for my company. Uh, we, we will be putting materials out there as well to support this stuff uh, going forward. Of course, the FAA um, clarification or revision of guidance related to HFDM. So that's it. I went a little fast on the talking speaks. I know we're going a little long schedule there, but I wanted to the last slide, which is pretty much I'll be at Expo. My contact information is up there for um, my uh, mobile phone and my work email. Please, if you've got any questions uh, or even better, if you've got any material that uh, might be useful to the cause, I would greatly value um, you shooting me an email or getting in touch with me by any means. and. Uh, with that, I'll go for questions. <laughs>
Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, let's see if we get any questions. None right now. Um, let's see. Anybody? Well, again, for folks that may or may not know what a helicopter safety enhancement is, um, there are a number of these that the USHST um, has embarked upon implementing and, and researching and, and as a result of the accident studies that, that, that the team did in the past. And, and, and certainly uh, this in one in particular was that, again, if, if a, a flight data monitoring uh, tool and program was in place that it could have helps help to mitigate or perhaps reduce the opportunity for an accident to occur. And so, um, you know, again, as, as, as Jeff said, as a small operator, uh, you, you, you have an opportunity to, to have, have this kind of resource on your aircraft and um, doing, doing some type of review of, of performance of flights uh, for yourself and, and or for other uh, pilots uh, that, that are operating your aircraft. Um, Jeff's got his uh, email address in the, in the chat for folks. Um, I think, looks like Cliff Johnson has a question. Uh, Ashton, I don't know if you can allow Cliff to speak. He raised his hand like a good student that he is. <laughs> Or Cliff, if you just want to type it into the, the chat or the Q&A. Hey, guys. Hey, yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we got you, Cliff. Okay. Um, great presentation, Jeff, as always. Uh, always enjoy working with you, my friend, over the years on different things. I guess the question uh, that I would, would have maybe for the group is for someone that isn't, you went over some of the different things, all the benefits that, that HFDM can provide uh, to an operator for those that um, you know that are uh, just getting started with it and you know how, how should they get started how can they learn more information about FDM and how can they really um, you know how do they get the program off the ground for what what is, has been because you guys have the unique perspective of not only were you um, an FDM manufacturer but you guys also were an operator as well, and you were collecting data off of your own platform. So maybe you could share a little bit about that from, from your perspective. I know I have my perspective from the SIAS program and everything, but uh, just for, for the folks out there, just to get them uh, to get them started with that, what, are, what do you recommend? Sure. So there's a number of ways to go. Uh, kind of two basic strategies to do the, well, three basic strategies to the data part. Um, you can do an all paperwork system. That, that, that's a lot of time if you are trying to do a, a data monitoring function. Um, and then if you're going to use a recording device, you, you've got the choice of something that records signals off the airframe, so parametric information. So you've got, say, engine and rotor RPM and airspeed and GPS uh, location. And then you've got uh, ones that take a, a, a video or audio uh, focused approach. Um, both of those are great. Um, you're trying to get perspective as to what your helicopter uh, was doing uh, while it was out there uh, in the fleet doing its job and so forth. Um, the system that I work with and that uh, my company developed is a parametric approach. So it doesn't use video or audio, but we've got 21 channels of data we're capturing five times a second and we are not so the good news there that uh, there's no pointing of fingers in the end, there's just information and how you manage that information is um, up to the operation largely. Again, if you're not subject to a mandate, you decide it's your data. Um, personally, I, think I've, I guess uh, one example I'll, I'll give, which is, um, you know, of course we had our equipment installed on our aircraft. Um, our, our test bed aircraft was an R44 and um, during the course of that, I actually did my commercial add-on. So I'm a fixed wing guy that uh, only added helicopter recently. Um, and I will tell you, it was very helpful at the end of every flight to be able to pull down that data 
and answer some of my own questions. Like, well, that first first approach went pretty good, but I didn't like the second and third one. What was actually going on there? And of course, as humans, we have limited ability to recall. When you can pull the recorder data down and really um, take a look at how you're doing things or what might have been different, you can make your next training session a lot more effective. So I think training environment, there's certainly benefits there and that saves you cost and increases your efficiency and training. And the other one, just from a justification standpoint, we had um, um, in the course of our flight testing, which does go out to the corners of the certified envelope but that helps. Uh, we did have a few instances where we crossed the line to say um, engine RPM by a small amount. Well, if you think about those sorts of things, they might happen quite frequently, say in an uh, air tour operator where you're pulling max power uh, to lift all those um, paying seats off the ground and go do your little air tour thing. When you get to the end of the day, um, that engine, that airframe might be uh, experiencing much higher than normal costs, even if you ignore the safety side of that, um, much higher than normal cost, just because you're using it a certain way. Maybe there's something operationally you can do to make sure you stay in limits. So for us, when we had an event to look at, we had exquisite data to look at. So if we went 0.1% over for three seconds, now we know what inspection to do and there's no doubt it wasn't any worse than that. So as far as maintenance and operational decision-making, one major event or one event that could have been major and you're actually making accurate decisions from data, um, a, a device can pay for itself on one event. So that would be um, my personal experience with that. And um, we had more than one event in which it was uh, valuable. So there you go. Already, I don't see. There are a few, a couple other questions, but not specific to your presentation, uh, Jeff. Other than uh, Nicholas responding to Cliff's uh, question, um, any other questions related to flight data monitoring? I I can't recall. Crystal might remember or even. Jeff, you, if there are any rotor safety challenge events at Heli Expo related to flight data monitoring, um, there, there are quite a few. I just can't remember if there was one there for folks that might be at Heli Expo to attend that session. I think there might have been. Yeah, I can think several, of quick one. Yeah, I was just going to say there's several. Um, you know, uh, yeah, whoever was going to chime in there. Uh, they had to, they had to stick I'll take a quick look and share a couple links, what I find. Okay, perfect. Well, Jeff, thank you again. Uh, thank you for all the hard work and in, in your team uh, on this helicopter safety enhancement. Um, for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, if you go to the ushst.org website, all of the, the helicopter safety enhancements are listed there. Um, we are always looking for, for folks to, to participate and help um, on, those, on those safety enhancements. So if, the, if, if, if this is something you're interested in, please uh, reach out to us at the helicopter safety team. If there are uh, something else that, that um, sparks your, your interest and, and, and you have some, some knowledge or expertise around that, um, you know, again, we, we are all volunteers and, and we're seeking other volunteers out there to, to contribute to, to, again, help uh, our industry as a whole. Um, some of the other questions that came in, I know there was one question uh, for Dr. Q um, from Anthony about blood thinners as a no-go flight standard. I, I don't know the answer to that. I did send her, Dr. Q, an email. I didn't get a re response back. I did post uh, in the chat an additional page on the FAA's website regarding specific uh, medications, pharmaceutical, uh, that might have some some guidance in there about blood thinners for, for uh, Anthony for you to, to take a look at. Um, one one of the other questions that came in from Ben Thomas he, he had missed that answer regarding the Army Aviation accident. Um, 
uh, been. So that accent was not incorporated or not accounted for uh, in the data that, that Lee was providing uh, that, that information or that data is strictly um, non-military, um, you know, not public uh, or commercial operations. Um, let's see, um, no other questions coming in. All right, well, good. We just have a few more minutes. Um, again, there's, there's several, several uh, links posted in the chat for everybody. Um, so I encourage you to, to take a look at those um, uh, for additional resources. Uh, if you're at Heli Expo, I highly encourage you to, to participate in the Rotor Safety Challenge or any of the professional education courses. Uh, most importantly, stop by the, the Rotor Safety Zone. A lot of good information will be provided there. You can check out the Coast Guard helicopter um, and, and meet the crew. Um, let's see, I'm looking through. Chris is providing uh, some information here. Focus flight training using data analytics on March 7th at 10.30 a.m. Good data makes good decisions on March 8th at, at 2.15. So um, you'll encourage you to go to the uh, Heli Expo website for those specific uh, Rotor Safety Challenge events. Again, uh, we've got um, two, at least two that we know of on, on March 7th at 10.30 a.m. and another one on March 8th at 2.15. Um, I'll uh, quickly copy and paste that to everybody. But there are some other wonderful topics there as part of the Rotor Safety Challenge. So. Um, and in conclusion, uh, if there are no other questions, um, we'll, we'll revert back. Uh, I think Wayne had to step off. So Nick, if you're still with us, any closing remarks? I am. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for organizing it. Another great session. Um, I just got a couple of things. Wayne didn't have, did have to drop off. Um, I, I just... Um, over-the-counter uh, medications has been something that we've been focused on for quite a while. We actually produced a, a safety bulletin on it, which I put in the link to you, Chris. Maybe you could drop it into the um, into the chat so that okay. you can see it. But it's a um, it's a two-page safety bulletin that um, uh, talks about a lot of the things that were talked about uh, just now. So um, take it seriously, guys. It's something that can easily catch you out if you've taken the wrong thing that you don't know what's in it. Um, apart from that, uh, I, ha I actually have a presentation that I'm giving at Heli Expo on the Wednesday at 13.30 uh, uh, Atlanta time on simulation um, to uh, talk about um, safety culture and, uh, and simulation um and to go over some of the latest statistics as well if you if you don't get to see them at the ushst all hands but apart from that looking forward to seeing you guys there um thanks again chris to your team and uh keep it in the green out there guys thanks great thank you very much nick um thank you again everybody else uh with that we'll conclude the webinar uh we'll look to have uh, another online webinar probably in, in the month of May and, and more info, information to follow. So thanks everybody for your participation. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful weekend, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you at Heli Expo. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, guys. We'll see you.